welcome back to the Grim Reader. This is my Grim Chronicles number 17. So my weekly reading uh, video. It was under the, the shadow or the kind of whatever you want to call it, um, the feeling of the sense of having finished this very, very big and important book, The Recognitions, last week. I think I finished it on Saturday. I had the vlog about that. That's right. <laughs> Seems so long ago. And um, I did pick up the book that I finished for this week, but it wasn't easy. Um, just I just where I'm at sort of with the end of the semester, I'm feeling sort of I always feel strange at the end of the end of the semester. I feel sort of glad that it's over, and this one being a Zoom one, with all the strangeness that is going on in the world, and also just some issues just dealing with my own health, which are sort of it's fine. It's actually good, but it's there's stuff going on there too. Um, and so the book that I read this week was Housekeeping by Marilyn Robertson. <sighs> I don't even know where to begin. Such a such a daunting task to to talk about Robinson because she's just so over uh, I don't know, her presence as an author is sort of it's awe inspiring and wonderful. Um, this pro I don't know if I, I I'm in two minds as to whether this was a good pick to pick after recognitions, but in a way it was. And so the reasons why it was is what I do love about housekeeping and what will you know make it have a special place in my heart is its female centeredness. It really de um, de centers the male voice in intriguing ways and for probably for for specific deliberate reasons it's really a very uh and that it centers on female voices in a really really interesting way so that's a big plus that's a big pro um and and so i'm i'm coming at this after having read the first three of the gileads and so you know my ranking is that Almost every page of Lila makes me cry in a good way. I mean, it's just very, very moving in the writing. Uh, and then Gilead's a very close second. Gilead is amazing, too. I really love the character of the pastor, John Ames, I guess. This is his name. I think it's John Ames. I liked Home less, but really for the only reason I don't like the sun. I really don't like this. And it's something about her characters that you really kind of have to make a decision as to how you feel about them. They're, they're like these real people. <laughs> and so housekeeping is different. And I really, uh, there, were, there were long stretches of it where I thought, I don't know how much I'm really liking this. And so part of it is the issue with her writing. Her writing is amazing. But in housekeeping, it borders on the, oh, this is a bit too precious. You know, there, there are sentences in here that are just... Um, so in terms of the plot, I should tell you a little bit about that, right? Um, so we're dealing with sort of generations of dysfunction having to do with trauma induced by terrible accidents happening. It, it opens with this terrible accident of a train falling into a lake in a small town and the grandfather passing away. So that's not even a spoiler. It happens right away. And so the generations that follow on from that are kind of, I would say that they're all, they've all been kind of affected by this event. And so you get the grandmother taking care of her daughters, as I recall, and all, and there's, and so something that Mar Marilyn Robinson sometimes does is she, she points to, uh, what's the, what's the modern term for this? toxicity of relationships or just something going on and and the way she phrases it in terms of the grandmother and her daughters three daughters is the 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 unkindness of children so there's something happens so that the daughters the three daughters are not able to connect in a warm loving way with this mother and all three of them are well i don't know about the third one but the two are, are damaged in a way they're they're severely mentally damaged and so um, you get the mother of the two main children, so that it's narrated by Ruth, and her, and then her sister's another main character, Lucille, and her her mother is Helen of the um, the grandmother, and then has the three daughters, Helen, Sylvie, and another daughter who I can't remember what happens to the other daughter. She's not really a character in here. What happens to the other daughter? There are definitely three of them, as I recall. Sorry, sorry to be so vague on the third daughter. 
Um, and so Ruth tells the story. And so one thing you get is a, you know, it's in retrospect, but it's extremely poetic. It is Robinson-esque prose, which I do think she kind of evolved a little bit in to the Gilead trilogy. There's, there's a, I think the Gilead writing is even more, because it doesn't have this preciousness of this, this sense of, oh, here's someone using a word that's unusual to describe something, or just it, sometimes the writing calls attention to itself, perhaps a little bit too much in housekeeping, to my mind. On the other hand, the ending is what kicks it up to five stars again for me. It's just so moving and sad and, uh, the, the, the sense that we get of, um, so what happens is, I'm sorry, I'm being vague about the plot. So the mother of the two children, so Ruth, the narrator and her sister, um, uh, what happens is that the mother, I don't know if it's a spoiler, is it a spoiler to tell you that she basically, as far as I can tell, and as far as we can all tell, but we're not sure why, does commit suicide. Uh, sorry, I, so, I don't know if this is spoilery or not. Maybe it has spoilers. But I don't think it will retract from your reading of this. And so the two daughters are left connected to the house of the grandmother. It's all kind of connected to this house in this small town where the, um, the grandfather has already passed away. And there's this house in this town. And a small town is called Housekeeping. Uh, sorry, fin uh, Fingerbone. The novel's called Housekeeping. Uh, and so... Um, what happens is they have various people come in. First, they have sisters of the grandmother come in to take care of the two girls. And they're very strange. They're very odd. And they don't really want to take care of children. You can tell. And so they're very happy when the other, when the aunt of the daughter, so the sister of the mother who committed suicide comes and decides to stay and look after them. And she's probably, you know, one of the central figures of the novel, and her name is Sylvie. And so she comes to the house after having been a transient. She's she's basically a female hobo. And so what Robinson does really, really well is describe how being a hobo is a very unique identity that gets into your way of being, and it's not one that you can simply transition out of once you're not a hobo anymore you know i'm calling it hobo specifically because this is connected to the depression and to america and to riding the the trains um and so what we see here is a person who on the one hand in in modern terms i do think would be described as quite severely mentally ill i'm thinking bipolar i'm thinking perhaps even schizophrenia is going on here sylvie and yet um the uniqueness of her character is her identity as a hobo. So things that she does while living there, um, and she's sort of, you know, she is very, very strange, and she's not really cut out to be a motherly figure, and yet she's put into this role where she's the surrogate mother for these two girls. And we see how her strangeness and her issues that she has, so she has issues with hoarding, um, she has issues with, for example, always wanting to eat cold foods and eating out of a can so or 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 the way she sleeps she'll sleep with her clothes on and and all her possessions close to her in a box so all these things that come from a from a life of being a transient she carries over and she never really uh transitions out of that and at the end we kind of realize it's because she doesn't want to she kind of pines for that life and she's a, she wants to go back to it and in a certain way, she does. Well, she does, and she does. And the thing is, she brings Ruth, our narrator, with her into this life of being a transient. Gosh, what a novel it would have been if we had one actually... I mean, it sort of talked about how their lives at the end, but an actual novel of them being a, being hobos. And, of course, being a female hobo brings certain aspects to it that are not really addressed in the book of, in terms of danger and... Um, you know, in terms of how you deal with your, your sexuality. Um, I do think that the issue of prostitution, but that's not addressed at all in the book. It's actually very, there's very little uh, of that in the book in general. The theme is really how the two girls deal with living with this very strange person who's not really cut out to take care of them. And I have to say, even after reading it, um, 
Sylvie's a really, really interesting character, and to me, she's not entirely, entirely, symp I'm not entirely sympathetic towards her. I'm somewhat more sympathetic towards her after thinking about all of it, and she's a sweet, poor dear, but there's almost something a little bit sort of manipul manipulative and sinister in how she co-opts Ruth to go with her to become one of her ilk. Um, and Lucille, she's the other character, main character, she's the sister who defects from this life, who really clearly wants to live a more normal life, a more mainstream life, who sort of goes to the majority. And so you get these kind of stark binaries of them versus us. And what happens at the very end is they try and, you know, get away. They do stuff to the house. The house sort of transforms into this weird, strange place. And um, there's sort of this funny moment where, I mean, not funny, kind of typical. For so the mother was attached to cats. And uh, initially, Sylvia has a strange relationship to animals. She's sort of kicking the dogs away. And the dogs respond strangely to her, too. And... Um, but at some point, she brings in cats to deal with the sparrows. I think, no, not sparrows. Oh, what are they called, those birds? Um, the other one, swallows. Sorry, swallows who have been nested in the second floor. So she brings cats in and they proliferate. So at the end, there's like 14 cats in this strange house full of sparrows, full of cans, full of newspapers. So she does exhibit sort of textbook hoarder it's another sign of her, I would say, her mental illness. So it's a fantastic book. And in the end, the writing does sort of take flight and become Robinson-esque, but in a way that I can relate to better. And it's, I don't exactly know why she kind of loses her... Um, it's it's good all the way through. It's ne There's never a bad sentence with Robinson. And so it's excellent writing, but it's sometimes in the beginning... Perhaps, I, maybe it was my just my own irritation or just the mental space that I was in that I couldn't connect to it as much. And then I, that my, and the, my, my own, what happens with Robinson is that you connect at a sort of psychological, emotional level. And my own issues with anxiety and with wanting a house or wanting to be safe in a space were kind of, so. and so with Sylvie not really taking care of these kids in a completely normal, mainstream way, She's not a very good caretaker. She's she's basically a bad. She she she's neglectful, and that ma that makes me anxious. Of course, I mean, and I think it would make anyone anxious. On the other hand, there is a side to her that Ruth responds to, and it, that is sort of sweet, and you sort of feel for her. You can't help but feel sorry for her for for what she's gone through, whatever it is. And so there's a really kind of complicated psychological stuff is happening there with with this book. I would definitely need to reread this. I need to reread all of Gilead. I need to read Jack, the fourth one in the book. Um, and in, so so the reason, so I really do go back to the fact that it was amazing to read this after Gaddis because of its uh, centering uh, of female voices. But I can sort of understand why people don't like it too, as, as you know, as I always do. It, it's sort of, it's set in in Robinson Land, so this small town Americana stuff, even though this is the Pacific Northwest, not the not Iowa, where where Gilead takes place. She's very good at evoking nature and the nature writing. I think if I read it again, I would pay more attention to it and dwell on it more. And so segueing into all the readathons that are happening. So the first readathon that this kind of does fit, I think. I mean, it, both both maybe Midrash and the Springathon, they always kind of come together to me in interesting ways, which says something about my... And this has a lot of nature stuff. And of course, it being Robinson, it is... There's a lot of biblical religious stuff in here. Uh, so her name is Ruth, so it connects to the story from the Bible, which I'm not that familiar with. And then at the end, there's even more sort of evoking of... There's a wonderful sentence. I don't know if I've highlighted it. Maybe I did. About God and humanity. Um... Yeah, so absolutely amazing, five stars, still processing, and we'll read again. That's, you know, that's where I'm at with this one. So the other book that I am well, well into, uh, and it's my audio book, because I, I finished, I had, I finished Gardens of the Moon, as I told you guys last week, is my first Louise Erdrich, uh, The Roundhouse. Phenomenal. I had no idea. This is great stuff, and I really want to read a lot more Erdrich's and I would love pe for people to tell me which ones I should read next. It's really well done. The narrator, the speaking voice is wonderful. And um, 
so it's the narrating actually kind of a similarity to the housekeeping is that it's a young person's point of view and it's really well done so this young man 13 years but he is it's also like a flashback so he's telling it from an adult perspective but looking back to this horrific event that happened to his mother she was brutally attacked and i don't we don't really know the circumstances yet it's coming out slowly and just his whole life is depicted really well and his father and the family and his friends and uh, there's scenes where the friends go and do stuff together the boyfriends the boy the group of boys and it's really well done and it's really fun to listen to uh it's it's a crime it's a mystery so you know but it's still so well done i'm really really enjoying it um kind of a nice thing to read alongside robinson so even though the the female is sort of the victim here the mother and but she does such a great job of portraying these characters i'm really really enjoying it i'm looking forward to reading more Erdrich. so yeah i'm so excited that i decided to listen to that one the two nonfiction books are a little bit stymied, so I have my biography of the Grimm Brothers that I want to get back into this week, and the um, the Patrick Rad and Keefe uh, take on um, the opioid opioid epidemic, the Empire of Pain. I haven't gotten to them as much, and we'll see how. I don't think I want to put them aside at all. Hopefully not. I just have a hard time going back to them when I'm, you know, I'm trying to do, go back to my I'd read a book a week thing after recognitions. And of course, now the readathon that's coming up is the 1900 to 1950. And I have some options there, too. Um, so we'll see how things go. Plus, I'm in this kind of weird end of semester mood. So stuff is happening. Connected to maybe Midrash um, and also Springathon. Is the book, I think I probably talked about this last year and I didn't get to read it, but I really, really want to read it also because she sort of talked about it in connection with Robinson and that is Annie Dillard, um, Pilgrim at Spring Creek, which I know a lot of you have read this and um, I really want to get into it. I do think it will take time and I want to sort of read it meditatively or intentionally and slowly because it is kind of like a book with a lot of nature in it and then sort of, you know, religion too. So it's a perfect pick for both Midrash and... Spring is on. It's like the two go together with me. Nature is my religion. I find I find the transcendent in nature and all that good stuff. And of course what's interesting about Dillard, there's that fantastic Atlantic article which was came out a while ago called Where Have You Gone? Because she sort of stopped publishing, whereas Robinson has kept going. And so her output is a little bit different from that. And she also has sort of focuses more on nonfiction stuff as as, as I gather, but but I always thought it was really interesting, and I have the book here. So she wrote a fan letter to Robert Richardson, who I just find out, found out has had recent has recently passed away last year. The biographer, the famous, you know, he's done a lot of biographies, and he this amazing biography of Amazon, which I really I got I got stuck in. I need to get back to this. I really want to finish this one. He has a Thoreau biography that's amazing, and apparently she wrote him a fan letter, and uh, and she says after two lunches and three handshakes they got married. <laughs> Uh, reader I married him so I just think that's a fun story I mean I don't know the the, the background um yeah just Emerson is just such an amazing interesting person to me and his writing I think I almost feel a little bit more kinship to him than Thoreau I don't, I'm not exactly sure why but I do and so uh yeah and of course Emerson would also fit the spring is on I mean he's old school I know guys but he did write that famous essay called nature which is amazing um so yeah so there's that what else so i might start this i'm not i'm not going to commit to the minor five because i have the other books going on so i'll put that out that's going to be a future thing just very quickly i wanted to show you the book that i got because i had to send the book back that i wasn't going to review because it wasn't good enough to review in my opinion but what i got instead and i think this will be fine and i'm going to really really enjoy this and give you more info on the Japanese Tales of Lafcadio Hearn. So Lafcadio Hearn, I'll give you more details, but he was um, a 19th century writer, apparently it says here best known writers, celebrated alongside side Mark Twain and Robert Louis Stevenson, born in Greece, raised in Ireland, became came to the New World, worked as a reporter in Cincinnati, so my neck of the woods, New Orleans, West Indies, and then he went, then he goes to Japan. And he becomes basically 
you know, a Jap he takes on a Japanese identity, a, a Japanese name, he marries a Japanese woman, and he becomes a collector of traditional Japanese tales. So one would have to be always mindful of the lens through which he's giving us these tales. On the other hand, maybe he's the perfect person as someone who's who's become who's decided to to stay there, but who's not of there. Maybe he's the perfect sort of transitionary figure for us. So I'm very excited to read this. Uh, has a, has a uh, introduction by Sipes and uh, also well four by Sipes and someone who I'm not that familiar with, Andre Kodrescu. Wait. Andre Kodrescu? Oh, yes, 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 NPR. I remember him from NPR, a novelist, essays, his many books include, yes, I remember him very well. Oh, he has a Twitter account. <laughs> I'll go find him on Twitter. So this is going to be fun, and this will be, I mean, I have to review this, so I'll have to read it carefully and tell you all about the Japanese tales of Lafcadio Hearn. I'm excited, I'm excited. And now we get into, the last thing I'll talk about is the 1900 to 1950 read-along. I have yet to start one of these because I had a hard time putting aside the Morris. I decided I'm not in the mood for Morris by Ian Forster. I'm not exactly sure why, but I just put it aside. And so I was sort of scrounging around through for, for options and I came up with, I kind of want to read this by Willa Cather. So Death Comes to the Archbishop is the one I have on my shelf. These are all 1900, 1950. Then Lolly Willows is really what I want to read. But then I'm sort of in the mood for a comfort read, an easy read, a comforting, easy read, and that would be Excellent Woman, probably by Barbara Pym in my beautiful Ola Keeley edition. So those are my three options, and we'll have to see what happens, where I land with those three. I'm sorry to be so vague about my next read, but it's going to be one of those, eeny, weeny, money mo. <laughs> and yeah, I think I'm going to put the two parts together. Um... I'm always a bit unsatisfied with my reviews. They're very vague and sort of like how I emotionally connected to a text, which is usually one thing about me. And I think it's one thing that does slow my reading down is how how much I connect. Uh, you know, I'm still getting teary eyed thinking about because the ending, especially with Robinson, that was such a sad ending. And one of the things that for me is always going to be sad about the book is the fact that the two sisters get kind of disconnected. You know, as someone who's very, very close to my own sister, um, they kind of, because of Sylvie in a way, you know, her strange, her strangeness, this, this, um, they don't, they're not allowed to, they don't, they can't remain together. And the very end of the book does sort of, the Ruth is thinking about what happened to her sister. She doesn't know. And she's sort of envisioning seeing her, you know, from her standpoint as a transient person. And it's really, I thought that was really sad. Um, or, and really moving and really wonderful, but sad too. I mean, that's the thing about Robinson. It's it's um, infused with a melancholy that sometimes is perhaps a little hard to take. This is not light stuff. This is, you know, and in that sense, it kind of reminds me almost a little bit of, of uh, Eliot. Um, excuse my teary eyes here, but George Eliot does the same thing. She really gets, to, she pulls on your heartstrings in such a sort of deep way. Um, and that's, that's, that's how I am as a reader. And that's why I kind of take a while to bounce back with certain books and, and any kind of heavy book. I mean, the recognitions, that's just such a, that's not just something to quickly go off. That's why I can't read a lot or, or as fast perhaps as other people. So I'm sort of reeling <laughs> and I need to sort of order my thoughts a little bit and calm down. And I guess I need to sort of look for better palate cleansers as Sarah calls them. Books that just sort of, and I don't have access to them. I mean, we watch our shows and stuff. Um, but I'm always just drawn to the heavy stuff again, be it nonfiction or history or whatever. You see what you can see the kind of stuff I read. Um, and then when I sometimes when I start a palate cleanser, uh, I get irritated with it, uh, unless it's something like Gardens of the Moon, which okay, on the one hand it's a palate cleanser because it's fantasy. On the other hand, oh yeah, pick the pick, pick the most complicated, serious, earnest, you know, fantasy. You know, I don't pick anything. I, sh you know, what I should do is read the Terry Pratchett. That's what I should do. Go back to Discworld. That'd be fun. <laughs> Something sort of lighter. Um, anyway, I'm blabbing right now, and I will talk to you soon. And thank you so much for watching and subscribing. And yeah, I love to hear your thoughts. I hope everything is going well for everyone. Rough time in certain parts of the world, don't we know? And yeah, life goes on. Talk to you very soon. Bye bye.